Thank you for coming uh, for the afternoon panel. I, um, I know that you had a very fruitful morning uh, for the two previous panels. So we would like to continue with that after, after our lunch with this wonderful change to its sun. So let's hope that the sunshine coming through the roof on us is going to also bring some positive perspective on the, on the bad children of the EU at this point. Um, and that is the Visegrad countries. We chose as Tapas uh, to have a panel on Euroscepticism in Central Europe because of the worrying developments in the region in the recent months where we have forces that tend to enter the mainstream political discourse, talking not only about the possible costs of EU membership or talking about should we or should we not enter the Eurozone. There was the debate maybe five years ago in the, um, in the pre-run for the European election the discourse has changed. People don't really talk now about should we or should we not have the euro. They even talk now about should we or should we not be in the European Union. Something that was considered completely irrelevant only a few years ago, where very few people talked about it. Those who did were considered outsiders. And maybe as we will see, that might be one of the reasons for the problem today, that it was not taken seriously in the sense of having a debate about what really are not only the benefits, but also the costs. What, are, what is our role in the European Union? What kind of policies we want to pursue? What, how we want to be seen there? And so we wanted to have a panel where we will talk about the, the causes of the current situation, the analysis of the current situation, and hopefully also proposals how to improve the situation that we could take back as um, center, center right um, think tanks and political parties and try to communicate to the people there who are pro-European how to improve it and how to change it. Um, the speakers of, um, of our panel come from the Visegrad countries. Uh, we have Mr. Bonnie, who is a Polish uh, member of the European Parliament, former minister of... Um, so social Affairs and Labour, Late Administration and Digitalization. Um, we have Ildiko Sensi, who comes from the Antal Yusuf oh, uh, Knowledge Center. Uh, she's the uh, vice director and the head of the Brussels office with really long history of, uh, of presence in Brussels and, and combining Hungarian and the European perspectives. And we have Veronika Neprasheva, who is a journalist uh, from one of the most respected, probably at this point the most respected uh, Czech newspaper, Hospodarska Noviny, who is um, probably the only newspaper that is trying to give a very objective and fact-based information about, um, about the European, European Union and, and the Czech presence there. Mr. Bonny, please, if I can ask you uh, to speak first. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. We uh, have just finished in uh, the Libe Committee uh, discussion on uh, the situation in Hungary with the participation of the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And it was very exciting because uh, when I have heard uh, the, the Minister I'm, I have considered that the language used by him was very close not only to authoritarian regimes, but also to the 30s from uh, the 20th century. And uh, it, it was, uh, it was uh, impressive in negative sense, of course. <clears throat> Firstly, how to describe the phenomenon of Euroscepticism in the Central European, Central Eastern Europe, especially after many years of the hard work to be a member of the European Union, and after some years of building uh, the position among countries uh, of the European family. We need to realize the context, analyze the symptoms, 
and understand as deep as possible the real causes. Secondly, just about the context. We are living in specific times. It is the post-truth era growing in many countries, among and across many cultures and socio-cultural and political environments. We are confronted with the ecosystem of the post-truth hazards, as well as with populism and illiberal democracy. There is a big impact of populism and populist mentality on our lives, the democracies, the models of shaping the public opinions. The liberal democracy as an area of common solving problems, respect to the minorities and all diverse partners, vibrant participation in democratic processes, the dominant model of politics as a source of evidence-based policies is threatened and eroded. Information addressed to the society is full of heated emotions. Misinformation is the symptom of the post-truth reality. It undermines the trust. It undermines the real terms of understanding the world, the reality, the history. It undermines the pattern and standard of the open-minded society. The post-truth societies are very often closed and extremely polarized. Everything is divided and polarized. As a result, one part of the society is standing vis-a-vis -vis another and they are fighting. Let's be clear, this is the real war. The fake news and narratives full of emotions are the instruments of this war. Words and expressions are weaponized. This is already a reality. The role of communication is, re is reduced and extremely simplified. It is better to create the quasi-religious obedient community than the civic society demanding their rights, expecting from the state to service to the citizens. Believers are needed, citizens with critical thinking should be excluded from the society. The view is, this view is strongly presented by the leaders of some countries by Kaczyński in Poland, by Orban in Hungary, by Zeman in Czech Republic, in the US by Trump. And it is disseminated by media in our part of Europe by public media which have lost completely the impartiality. In this outlook, the state should be omnipotent, powerful, not neutral, rather full of values with heated emotions based on nationalistic identity. In the extreme version, there is no room for the knowledge, scientific view on historical processes, on genuine roots of the society. In the current time, we probably can say the prejudice-based society, the prejudice-based policies. The prejudices are above the knowledge, the emotional manipulation is above the rational and reasonable understanding. So very often the public opinion is the result of manipulation. In this context, it is easy to establish the negative emotions towards European Union. These emotions create skepticism vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Thirdly, just about specific Central European background for Euroscepticism based on some experience. Through many years during the Cold War, our societies lived under the Soviet domination. We defended the spirit of our national tradition and independence we have fought for freedom many times. But don't forget the hidden consequences of this domination, the long-standing negative impact on the awareness and mentality. For this debate, we can describe two types of the cultural pattern of the citizenship, Homo Sovieticus and Homo Democratus. What does it mean, Homo Sovieticus? It means passive citizenship. 
the lack of aspirations, no need to have the impact on public life, escaping from the freedom, oriented at the omnipotency of the state from politics to the, to the social issues, not being ready and open for cooperative values and skills, very often based on the deficits of trust and confidence, the low level of the social capital. After 1989, many years we wanted to overcome these attitudes in some groups of the society. But assessing now, our efforts were too weak. We didn't change the educational systems sufficiently. The focus on pro-democratic, pro-European, pro-equality values was not properly implemented. And finally, the leaders did not do their job. Politicians have started to play the marketing game in politics, not taking up brave reforms and long-term responsibility. Of course, we wanted to create homo democratus. It meant to develop the active citizenship, aspirations in the public area, internalization of freedom, the model of the state oriented at the service to citizens. We started via decentralization model of the state to implement the principle of subsidiarity. We wanted to build the major civic society, trustworthy model of the relations between institutions and citizens, social confidence and capital. But we were more focused on the efforts on of the transformation adjustment to the European single market, adequate use of the European financial resources for development, then on the work to keep and develop the democracy. Fourthly, what are the links between the remaining pattern of the Homo Sovieticus and populism in the modern politics in the light of the European Union problems? Populism in our part of Europe is the combination of the distribution of fears, threats, and at the same time, distribution, distribution of dignity. How does it work? People are tired of the long-lasting reforms. They don't understand the world of globalization, fast changes caused by new technologies, new cultural patterns, multiculturalism, the diversity principle, Especially, they don't understand the support for some groups like LGBT. It is too quick and too much for the conservative mentality. In 2015, people were threatened by the politicians using the image of refugees, migrants, attacking our Christian values in Europe. All threats, concerns, problems in these messages are coming from Europe. This message is clear, used by leaders of the public opinion from different kinds of groups. The Brussels is reduced to the bureaucracy. The powerful enemy imposed the strange solutions. This is the background for the new phenomenon, Euroscepticism. In political, anti-European language, the European Union is in the state of a permanent crisis, economic, financial, moral, institutional. It is very difficult to present the European Union as a success story. At this stage of our development, in this part of the EU, the value of sovereignty is stronger than the, national, than the rational principle of subsidiarity. The situation can look like we are the people, and vis-a-vis -vis us, there are the European bureaucrats. The European Union is the rigid institution and vis-a-vis -vis we have vivid nations with their needs, identities, dignities. How simple it is. And how often the leaders coming back from the meeting of the European Council, uh, from the European Council to their national, to our national capitals, presented the view that they felt independent, but that Brussels imposed the view, the decisions, and legislation. There is only one area in which the approval of the EU is common. 
it regards the economic issues, the advantages of the single market, the financial resources which are seen as a tool to develop national policies. It means that two anchors of the European Union, single market side, economic advantages, and the European Values Union, democracy, openness, non-discrimination, diversity, are not considered as anchors together. Fifthly, the difference between the perception described very briefly and the results of the perception research. Available data reveal a number of disturbing trends in the heart of Europe, including warning support for core transatlantic institutions like NATO, tensions over the nature of the European identity, and discontent with socio-economic challenges. In general, the support for the European Union in the all Visegrad countries, V4 Plus and Baltic countries, remains high. Within the last four years, most, most of respondents perceive, perceived EU fairly positive or neutral. In all V4 countries, to the least extent in Poland, one can recognize the threat of increased Russian influence, which has the potential to undermine a key pillar of peace and security. The data also reveal ambivalence about the nature of a European identity. More than one third of respondents in Czech Republic, 40%, and Slovakia feel that the European Union is pushing them to abandon traditional values, while 41% of Slovaks believe that Russia has taken the side of traditional values. In Czech Republic, 27, Hungary, 18, Poland, 14%. Reflecting dissatisfaction with the state of the economy and public services, a significant portion of respondents feel that their socioeconomic status is closer to that of Russia than Europe. 39% of Hungarians think that their social benefits have more in common with Russia than Europe, followed by 26% in Slovakia, 24% in Poland, 15% in Czech Republic. Similarly, 37% of Hungarians say that their economy and standards of living is more similar to Russia's than Europe. And in addition, 74% of Hungarians don't think young people have a good future in Hungary. And half of respondents feel that the country is headed in the wrong direction. 28% say that poverty and inequality are the most important problems facing Hungary, followed by corruption. But the results of the elections are clear. Sixthly, how to interpret these trends? They mean that there is a basis for Euroscepticism. But the picture is mixed. The Russia is the meaningful reference point, in some cases so-called positive, when it concerns the cultural values, in some negative, when it is related to the socio-economic aspects. I would risk the hypothesis that in our part of Europe, we are on the crossroads, halfway to the European Union and halfway from Russia or from the Homo Sovieticus pattern, and that we are not consistent. We don't accept fully Western values in the sense of openness, but in parallel, we are following the Western economic aspirations. Paradoxically, currently, we are full of concerns about the European Union because it is for our political leaders easy to express populistic concerns. We are looking at them and following them. By doing this, we feel more comfortable and secure with my personal question mark and the question marks put when I'm uh, looking at this kind of behavior from the part of society. This is, in my view, this feeling of uh, security and be comfortable, the populistic illusion. And I'm afraid I don't know how long it is going to last. But at the end, we will finish in the optimistic way. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the analysis that takes into perspective actually all the different uh, factors that come into the situation, which is giving a perfect ground then for open um, <clears throat> the, the debate later. I'm very glad that you mentioned the problem of EU or Russia, because that seems very often to be where the debate stands right now. And we actually had um, in February uh, a conference with Marta Center and Platform Ambatoska on this, uh, discuss this very topic of the, the Russian influence in Central Europe and the effects of this. So I'm sure that we will come back to that. You also mentioned the very important aspect of educational reform, or rather the absence of educational reform, which is a problem in all four countries concerned. And um, the failure of the leaders, that's, I believe, also something that's very common. So for all the four countries in the Visegrad Four, we have some factors which are shared in all of them. But of course, all of them also have their very specific situations. That's why I will now ask for the perspective of Hungary, a country that is very much discussed these days. So Ildiko, please, if you can help us understanding the point of Hungary. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it's a, a great honor for me to represent here a Hungarian foundation, which has a Brussels office, the Anta Joseph Foundation. I would like to tell you all that this is not a political foundation, so this is a non-political association a foundation, which is uh, basically uh, trying to continue and, and uh, make possible to follow the heritage of uh, Prime Minister Antal, who was the first uh, uh, democratically directly elected Prime Minister in Hungary. So, <coughs> it's, um, we have heard a lot of, lot of information for Mr. Boni, um, also lots of percentages and data, and I'm very interested also about some of the Polish percentages because we heard lots of things about Hungary since uh, the elections was not um, long ago. However, uh, let me start uh, to give uh, the topic a little bit of a wider context, and um, I would like to focus on three uh, different topic, uh, three different points. First is that we live in an age of insecurity. Second, I would like to touch upon again uh, what was mentioned before, uh, the economic insecurity and afterwards what it causes. And then allow me to talk a little bit about what I mean on populism. And thirdly uh, and lastly, I would like to a little bit talk about Hungary. So the context is not easy. Uh, if you look at the papers today, uh, just I got the paper from uh, uh, recently, the, the Spiegel had the, the main title, Who is Saving Europe? or I'm sure many of you have seen it in the stores uh, on foreign affairs, is coming out with a new, uh, a new um, magazine just dedicated on, on democracy, and it says that democracy is dying. So this context is not really positive, I would say. So it seems like something is going on in the world, and many of us are trying to answer the questions from different angles. Of course, the global uh, questioning uh, this, uh, this what is going on from the global perspective gives you a different answer than from the European perspective or from the Visegrad perspective. So let me start first saying that um, is democracy dying? No, democracy is not dying. Uh, however, there are problems and one of the major problem is I think is insecurity. You can say that there is an insecurity concerning geopolitical, um, from the geopolitical side, but however, there is also an insecurity inside the countries. So we saw that democratic countries, whether you mention uh, the marginally uh, democratic countries of the, the V4 or the, the classical democratic countries, the established democratic countries like France, Germany, UK, uh, Holland, um, United States, we could say like about, we are talking about 90 countries. We all go through something. Something is challenged out there. Many times it's easy to say that something authoritarian is going on. I would say, well, there is no, there, of course there are um, um, movements which can be said or adjectivized as, as authoritarian. But let me mention you that just recently, the 
Economist Intelligent Unit came out with clear data. They looked at uh, uh, 195 countries and they looked at their democracy ratios. And they have basically four different democracies, or they, they, they put the countries into four different groups. The first group says full democracies, the second is flawed or flawed democracies, the third is the hybrid regimes, and the fourth is the authoritarian regimes. So there are quite many steps from full democracies to authoritarianism. Hopefully most of the European countries are either in the full democracy ratio or in the flow uh, democracies. If you want to look at um, the economist intelligent unit outcome, basically if we look at democracies, most of the democracies are belonging to the second group, which is the flawed democracies. 56 countries belong to this, starting with the United States. According to the European Economist uh, Intelligent Unit, what does flawed democracy mean? That they have fair, free elections, basic civil liberties, they may have issues, for example, media, uh, they may have issues with the political culture, but at the end of the day, their governance is, is working and they are following democratic principles. Why am I mentioning this? Um, I, when I read different articles about what's going on and is, is, uh, this is the end of the democratic century, I would say that we have to be very, very careful what kind of words we are using. It's really easy to say that this country is getting into autocriticism, but let me say that there are clearly a huge, um, how do I say, a huge scale from full democracy to reach autocratic, uh, autocratic countries. So it's important to, to raise the fact that um, these countries, especially the European countries, are still far away from autocracy. Uh, yes, auto uh, auto authoritarian. Uh, um, governance. My second point is the economic security. So we live in a world not only about um, geopolitical insecurity but also there is an economic insecurity and I think this is a very important point. There have been hundreds of studies how economic insecurity is affecting democracy. Um, it's certain that extreme inequality is incompatible with democracy. If you look at uh, Thomas Piketty's data, he really puts uh, the data from wealthy top countries to poor countries. And basically, you can say that if the country is really, you can really see the gap between uh, very rich and very poor, in those societies, democracy is not as strong as should be, or there is no democracy at all. Today, we know that uh, this gap is increasing, unfortunately, even in Sweden, which is like the top welfare state of the European Union. So how this will go? Um, well, I think Europe has here a very important responsibility that we have to secure that our economy is growing and not uh, providing insecurity, especially I'm mentioning inequality here. My third point, as it was mentioned by Mr. Boni, um, there is um, a culture shock. Uh, you, you said, you mentioned culture change. I would say, um, I call it this more like that we live now in a machine age. Thanks to technology, uh, thanks to automatization, certain parts of the world from agrarian economies, industrial economies and service economies actually moved into the sector of knowledge economy. What does this mean? In 2000 and 2010, for example, over 85% of US manufacturing jobs were eliminated by technological advances. This is a very big data and similar data we see also in the European Union. Of course, looking at unemployment rates is a tricky question, but we have to deal that there is a cultural um, revolution out there, which includes very much the new type of uh, revolution 
caused by the machines. Last not last, not last uh, I should also mention that while we have this culture change, we also have to face with the aging society problem, which is, I think, a whole problem in generally in Europe. <coughs> The aging society is putting such a pressure on our social and uh, economic uh, institutions that we cannot uh, face, we cannot say that we, we don't face this problem. So now let me turn how populism I define. I think there is a very big difference if you say that a Western European country is a populist. For example, there are some populist movements in, in Holland or in France. Or you say there is a populist movement in the East part of Europe. I think the two cannot be washed. Why am I saying this? The populist movement of the West is against the present state of play, which means that they have a problem which we call sometimes, this is like the anti-establishment anti uh, movement, they have a problem with the present establishment. Maybe because of the economic crisis, they feel that they are getting poorer. Maybe because they see some enemies in their uh, neighborhood and becoming xenophobic. Or they have other uh, ideas that I had other ideas to go against it, but basically they are against the establishment. How I see the populism movement of the East, let me refer um, the, the countries uh, you mentioned, like some of the Visegrad countries. If you talk about populism, what's happening, populism in the East, well, the people who are populist, I would say they are patriotist. They want to represent their nation. There is no problem of economic uh, aspects here in the, in the eastern part of Europe because our economy is actually booming. So these people are supporting the development which was started. Uh, what we see here that they are more concentrating on, um, on um, fighting against the left um, part of the society, the, le the left political parties, because they think that uh, they are still part of the old communist type of thinking. And what we see here is that these populist movements are against, they have an enemy which is not inside of the country, but outside. So something coming from foreign countries, from out there. So while the populism of the West is, is trying to fight against what's inside the country, I think on the other side, these countries in the East are fighting uh, against the fears which are coming from the outside. So I think uh, there is a big difference. We can discuss this. I'm happy to answer some of the questions. And as I told you at the beginning, I'm um, happy to talk about also about the recent results of the Hungarian elections. Uh, as you know, uh, the Orban government won the elections with two-third majority. I have to tell you that nobody was expecting this result. It was a huge surprise for many of us. Nobody can say that Hungary is not a democratic country since the participation was 70%. So 5.7 million people actually went there and participated out of the 8 million uh, people. Uh, we looked at different lists. What could have happened if our um, election uh, system is more like the UK system or the Italian system or the Greek system? Well, according to all these systems, the Orban uh, government would have won anyway. With the, very interestingly, uh, if we use the UK system, he would even win 85%, not the 66% what he actually have now in the, in the, in the Hungarian parliament. Um, <clears throat> let me finish here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm sure there's going to be um, some questions about, about Hungary because it's really a topic that interests many people. 
Uh, what I think is very important to say that, yes, these countries are looking for an external enemy. The question there is to what extent it's real, or to what extent it's imposed by the populists in order to create a feeling of an external enemy. Here, of course, comes also the issue of, of Russia and Russia's role in creating this image. Um, for the economic, it might, from my perspective, it might not be directly because, yes, the countries are economically doing rather well. But at the same time, because of the structure of the economy, very often there is also growing economic inequality in the countries where we have regions, and of course, coming from Czech Republic, we have Prague. That is, by the standards of the region, by far the wealthiest region. And it's a relatively small country if we take into consideration its geographic size. And then we have regions <coughs> that are very backward, not only compared with Prague, but the average of the country and the average of the region. And the very little flexibility of the labor force, the, the unwillingness, which is, for example, different from, again, some of the other countries in the region, the unwillingness of the people to travel, to change. And there are other factors that, of course, cause this. But it's also part of the, of the local culture. And that's the moment when we see the differences between the individual countries. So why it's important to see them as a group, it's also really important to see them as individual countries, because there is no policy that fits all, not even all regions. And understand the very specific case of the Czechs that Mr. Pony already mentioned, the, the problem of the Czech feeling with the EU. We mentioned that a little bit last night during the dinner. But now we have Veronica, who is a journalist that actually knows very well what the Czech politicians know and do not know about the EU, how they feel about the EU, and then, of course, also their connection with the Czech public. So please tell us more about this. Okay, so thank you. Uh, at first, let me thank you, Topaz and Lucy, for invitation. I deeply appreciate it. Thank you, you have come and you're interested in a Central European uh, topics and problems. And uh, <laughs> let me start my speech with a little survey, too. Uh, uh, this one was made by a uh, Czech organization, European, which deals with European topics and, uh, and its uh, impact uh, on society. And this survey was made in the uh, uh, fourth quarter of last year after the Czech parliamentary election in four middle European uh, countries that used to create the former Habsburgs uh, empire. So uh, in Czech Republic, Slovak, Slovenia, and Hungary and Austria. And uh, the main question of this survey was, should your country stay in EU? And let me uh, at first present results in Czech Republic. So 54% of Czechs uh, answered, yes, we should stay in EU. And uh, 34 said, no, we should leave EU. Maybe it uh, sounds quite positive because the bigger uh, half of the nation uh, uh, is still for our membership in EU. But let me compare the results in the rest uh, of states. So, uh, in Austria, 77% votes still for uh, staying in EU and just 15% want to leave EU. In Slovakia, it's 69% for uh, stay and 22% uh, for to leave. In Slovenia, it's 79% uh, people uh, answered uh, we should stay or Slovenia should stay in EU and only 13% voted for to leave. And in Hungary, which is maybe the biggest surprise of this survey, 84% uh, people uh, answered yes, we should stay in EU, it's important, and only 9% want to leave EU. This result just confirmed the, uh, confirms that uh, Czechs are the most uh, skeptic nation uh, in whole EU. And despite our great current economic situation, despite the uh, Czech Republic has been clear acceptor of uh, European money since uh, 2004, we have joined EU. And uh, thanks for this money, we uh, 
could build and repair hundreds of kilometers of highways. We could build uh, maybe hundreds of school buildings and state buildings. Uh, we can repair our historical monuments and so on and so on. And despite we have the lowest unemployment in EU. So the main question uh, of all this is how is this possible? Uh, how this dispro disproportion between the reality and the benefits we uh, deserve from the EU and our skepticism against EU. I've created uh, six um, basic points uh, as I find it. So uh, the first of all uh, is um, something which maybe sounds quite simple. But uh, I think it's a really important point uh, n which not to be um, which should be mentioned. And it's a contemporary political massage of top Czech authorities and politics. Uh, the most of Czech uh, politics uh, in the uh, 90s has been Eurosceptics. And one, maybe you know our former uh, president and prime minister, Mr. Václav Klaus. He was uh, one of the most visible and uh, important politic uh, in Czech Republic in the 90s. And uh, he is uh, still the, one of the biggest anti-EU fighter to, uh, until mm, these days. So that means almost 12 years of hard Euroscepticism and anti-EU attacks. And uh, that uh, beca became louder, even more uh, powerful when Václav Havel, our former president, uh, fulfilled his mission as a president and uh, he died in 2011. And since then, there's no as strong and as powerful voice for EU as are the voices against EU. So uh, another point, as I find it, is uh, unpopularity of European agenda and topics in my country. Because as uh, Mr. Boni mentioned already, it, uh, it's very easy to follow up uh, the way of interpre interpretation that uh, that is the EU, the creator of uh, the whole uncomfortable political decisions. And uh, Czech politics just uh, have used to blame EU for every bad situation that happened in a Czech country. And then uh, they, they refused to accept their own responsibility for uh, this and for uh, the situation in EU too. Uh, so uh, they've started to claim EU as the author of every bad consequences. Uh, the third point I'd like to mention, or i like to create, is uh, this ability of Czech pro-EU politics and parties to claim their uh, Euro-optimistic orientation. Uh, there is a strange situation, because uh, last four years, in Czech Republic, we have uh, we had a leading coalition of three Euro-optimistic parties: uh, Social Democrats, uh, People Party, and a new political movement of uh, present or current Prime Minister Andrei Babiš. Uh, uh, though this coalition hardly talk about the importance of uh, our membership of EU, uh, uh, people. Uh, or, no, I started in a different way. Uh, well, uh, th this government declares uh, that they are pro-EU and uh, they're talking about uh, the importance of our membership, but not so loud. And uh, when the leader of uh, ANO, uh, ANO movement, yes movement, were accused by European anti-fraud office, and when he realized that anti-European rhetoric bought uh, uh, him more political points, he started with an open EU critics and 
he won the election. So uh, on the other hand, and what uh, that's what I blame our politics, pro-European politics on, is that their uh, Euro-optimistic parties overslept and just uh, to declare EU is good, is, de de uh, is de uh, desperately not enough, no. The fourth reason I can see is a bubble of populism. This, this is the reason of Euroscepticism uh, that Czechs shares with the rest of Europe. Uh, I think there become a great gap in creating, uh, creating an enemy we could blame for our problems and we have to define against. And for Czech authorities and politics, it was Euro currency and uh, migration, migration crisis, uh, of course. And despite there are hardly 12 uh, migrants in the Czech Republic, this threat was, won the election, <coughs> actually. So this is the uh, logic, as Mr. Borne uh, was talking about, that enemies uh, outside. Um, uh, that's uh, that's what I agree with. The fifth um, uh, problem I see in a uh, Czech politics scene is the ivory tower, as I find it, the ivory tower of Czech politics in EU. Uh, no matter which political party Czech politics in European institution represent, uh, if anti or pro-European, if uh, they're in Brussels, they act uh, almost the same way. They confirm the importance of EU and the membership of Czech Republic, and don't uh, I, and they uh, don't translate the complaints of their home political parties at all. And on the other hand, when they are back in Czech Republic, then usually don't present the European agenda they participate uh, in or. Uh, they don't defend its benefit. So they just talk about the cons and they don't talk about pros. And the last point I see, and uh, it's uh, shooting into my, <laughs> into my uh, lines, is the rule of Czech media. Uh, as political, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for politics, it's easy to follow up uh, the way of interpretation that EU is the by the guy, uh, so it's easy for Czech media to follow this uh, logical too. So the EU skepticism of Czech authorities uh, reflects in uh, media interpretations, and the most common EU agenda or uh, topics Czech media used to write about is uh, what the bad EU dictates us and what forbites us. And there are very few journalists who understand really EU laws and know the current agenda and are able to present it normally and understandable to people. And uh, the last but not the least reason uh, that European agenda is just not sexy to write about and it's complicated and uh, often theoretic. People don't know uh, uni how union works. Uh, people don't know uh, its institution and how politics and people can influence it. So they don't want to read it because it's just too complicated. And uh, we as journalists are not able to offer them the understandable way to uh, to describe the EU agenda and EU topics. So I think that's it for my first speech. Thank you. Thank you for that. I guess the last problem, it's not only the problem of the Visegrad countries, it's a, it's a general problem of how to report about the EU, that it would be comprehensible, that uh, it would be interesting for the people and on the other hand, I do have to admit that after the UK, the Czechs are the masters of Euromyths, and they simply love them. And that's one of the 
points where the Czech pro-European political elite has completely failed. And that's they already know the areas that are possible, very easy to, to disinterpret and misinterpret. And they always react, and it's always wrong to react, because once you only react, the thing is already there, and the Czechs always say that it must be true, at least partially. So then they try to explain, it's just too late to explain. So instead of first presenting what they are proposing and what it's about, what it's good for, they wait for someone to create a myth and then try to explain the myth, and that's just pointless. Nobody reads that anymore. So we have lots of stories of things that the EU dictates out of the projects. Um, Babish is very interesting. Uh, that's the thing that, that, that you mentioned, because he's exactly the, the person who has his party or movement has MEPs here who are very pro-European. He adopts anti-pro-European rhetoric based on what he needs at that point at home, whatever his marketing team tells him to say, which puts the MEPs in a very complicated situation because they don't believe what he says. And when asked, they say things that are actually contradictory to what he says. And that is not allowed within his movement, because it's a movement of one man. I mean, it says it all that he was elected as a chairman by 100% of the vote. So it is a one-man show, show. <laughs> for sure. So you cannot have a different opinion. That's why some of the MPs, MEPs actually left the movement, because they did not like what he was saying. Uh, he had a very anti-European rhetoric before the election, then he wins the election. Of course, his business depends very heavily on EU subsidies and on EU market. So he cannot afford uh, to be anti-European. So right away he goes to Brussels and he takes his selfies in the European Parliament, making all the people who are getting worried about the whole possibility of a referendum because of his alliance with extremists a possibility. And in this way, that's what I see and many other people, he, that's his danger, that he actually goes with the vote and there is no true program, there is nothing to discuss, there is nothing to be a partner for, for parties like the centre-centre right, because there is no program. There is popularity, there is the vote, and as we have an, one election almost every single year, there is the permanent campaign that he's a master at. But that takes me uh, to to two questions I would like to ask to all of you. The first one is something that was mentioned earlier today in the previous panel. And I believe that we should address that. Whether the Visegrad countries and these politicians, like Mr. Babish and Mr. Orban, make the countries actually an EU free riders. The people who simply collect the benefits of integration, their parties collect the benefits. Again, as I said, Babish heavily depends on the EU for all his business. But at the same time, they collect votes by being anti-European. And as was said in the previous panel, if everybody would do that, there would be no EU, which would be a disaster for these parties. And then we have, uh, we have them represented here. They often don't really do well in the negotiations in representing the country's interests, yet at home then they talk about the dictates and uh, the EU being worse than Moscow in many respects. So that's one thing. Another question that coming to Moscow, uh, what role Russia has in this discourse within these countries, trying to send the countries one against another trying to use them as means of destabilizing the EU within, for example, by taking the discussion away from should we have a referendum or when we should have a referendum on, the, on Euro or should we have a Euro, to should we stay or should we leave the European Union, which of course makes everybody very nervous to even start a legitimate discussion on this. So if you can say a little bit on both and then we will give floor to the audience. Mr. Bonny, yeah. I have I have no uh, simple answers for for those questions. Yes, because uh, uh, I think that uh, without deeper understanding of some mechanisms of modern politics related to populism, there is no possibility to understand how some politicians are 
playing the game, because this is profitable. Being in the European Union for those parties, for colleagues of the leaders of those parties and so on, generally speaking, for people from the country, uh, is profitable. Money for development, supporting many areas, open common market and so on and so on. But on the other hand, I think that they are making the difference between this kind of, of uh, making profits and different kind of profits related much more to, to, po to populism, which means that they are playing the game and uh, treating the European Union as a scapegoat. Okay, something wrong, uh, European Union, something bad. I have mentioned that the populism is a combination uh, of distribution of fears and, and threats and also dignity, and which means to give the feeling of the security. So this is this kind of the game. Uh, and I think that it, it's, it is immoral. It's out of the ethics in, 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 in politics, my view is clear uh, at that area. And look at, at, at one issue very often, and also in our discussion it was, uh, it was visible. Uh, people are saying, okay, but those governments are after elections. So democracy is okay. But what does it mean, democracy? In 1933, it was also a democratic election. So democracy is only the elections, not procedures, not participation, not functioning of separation of powers, not the rule of law, and so on and so on. I'm, I'm very surprised that many Europeans are putting the question, okay, with democracy in Europe, everything is okay. We need to be cautious and we need to, to, to use some kind of alerts because it's a very dangerous situation. I'm not sure what kind of results we will have in the next year during the uh, election, to, election to, the, to the European Parliament. How many extreme parties will, will go, will enter to the European Parliament and it will block uh, uh, to take, uh, uh, taking some uh, decisions by the, by the Parliament. So this is, a this, is a, this is a model of politics. And I think that uh, to, to, to that time in which it's profitable on both sides, economic and political, people will lead this kind of, uh, 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 of politics. Uh, Polish government is presenting the view that, okay, we need to M m consider our Polish uh, dignity, which means we are not under the pressure of the European Union. And they are trying to discuss about Article 7 and the rule of law. And from January to the end of April, the new prime minister uh, is uh, playing the game. There, is, there are any changes in the law in Poland there are the same threats as it was some months ago. But they are talking that they are in conversation with the European Union. On Russia, uh, I think that we need to consider two kind of influences of Russia. Firstly, it's uh, related to the real work done by Putin and, uh, and his team. Uh, it's, it's important for misinformation. It's important for the impact of some people who are very close uh, to uh, Russia secret services, Russian secret services. It was described by Polish journalist Tomasz Piątek, the relations of Polish, former Polish Minister of Defense Antoni Macierewicz uh, with Russian agents in his uh, environment. So this is one issue, and I think that for Putin it's uh, fantastic that uh, we have many problems, that there are many uh, activities uh, and discussions on referendum of uh, going out of the European Union. I'm, I'm not thinking that he is uh, focused on our part of Europe, but uh, uh, press, uh, making the pressures on our part of Europe, he wants to destroy the European Union much more uh, generally. 
And the second aspect of uh, the influence of Russia is uh, mentality. I have described it in this Homo Sovieticus, yes, uh, uh, mentality, and this is a real problem, yes. It's not uh, generally addressed, I, I'm not addressing this issue to all Polish people, but I think that there is the part, yes, uh, and uh, they, uh, on the other hand, I think that if you will ask them, they will say, okay, we are anti-Russians. But their mentality is uh, uh, close to, to Russians. I, want, I think that it would be better to say Soviet, yes. And, and there are dangerous. So this is a very specific momentum in the European politics. And we need to consider how we need to react. We need to be much more stronger. We need to understand uh, the dangers and we need uh, to discuss openly on those issues, not to say that, okay, after democratic elections in, uh, uh, in Budapest, in, in Hungary, in Hungary there, is no, there is no problem. This is a real problem for our, all our countries. Thank you. Aldika, can I ask you? Yes, I would like to uh, start out saying that I think there is a huge communication problem out here because some way or the other, the message... Uh, that, for example, uh, the, the EU budget is, is uh, uh, given away to agriculture purposes, to structural funds, uh, to infrastructure, some way or the other, the people don't connect that this is coming from the EU. So I think uh, here, the European leadership, the European Union leadership, and especially Brussels has a huge uh, responsibility here to communicate and also with also national it. leaders. Why we are only, I'm sorry. But, Why uh, very, can I? Yeah, but, 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 but you know, this is a real problem that very it often we want to make. Some, okay, Brussels should say to the Polish people that uh, Brussels is good. Polish people and Polish government also should say the same. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> after we finish, we're going to give the floor so to the I will explain after that. So I've been, I've been long working with the European budget, where I was in different position, and now we are, as you know, uh, we are discussing the multi-annual financial uh, framework, and it's coming back and back, that how is it possible that those countries who get the most money, they are somewhere or the other, um, they don't put the picture together that this money is coming from from uh, from the EU. And that my my very special example is that how is possible that the French farmer doesn't know that most of the money is actually coming to, from Brussels? And people told me yes because the French cow doesn't have an EU flag on it. So um, I know this is a. Um, sometimes we say that it's an um, easy easy um, question, easy easily answered. But unfortunately, what we see is that most of the time the citizens are not realizing how much we pay into the budget and they don't know how much money is coming back. Um, concerning the, the Hungarian elections, the Hungarian elections was not based on the EU issues. It was, uh, the slogans were not about EU at all. I think um, the recent, because of the recent polls uh, made by, uh, public by the, um, by the Nasal Bond Institute, there is a problem, uh, these countries have a problem with uh, generally with the Brussels leadership and not with the EU. So here I would really like to point it out that according to my point of view, it's somewhere or the other, the people are mixing the EU with the Brussels leadership. It's two different things. Hungarians are pro-EU because we see the future in this. Um, this, uh, uni in this unity, we see the immense value of this unity. However, people are concerned what the leaders are doing here in Brussels. And I have the data here, and I'm really happy to, to disseminate because I have some copies with me. According to the recent uh, data, um, uh, the questionnaire was sent from Germany uh, down to Serbia. So basically the big uh, Central European countries were all addressed. And according to this data, when we asked about the satisfaction with the Brussels leadership, uh, every country is rather uh, dissatisfied. Only in Germany we have a 47-45, which means that pro 
rather satisfied 47 and 45 were rather dissatisfied. So it's almost, almost the same number. In the other countries, however, there are huge differences. So in most of the countries, uh, the dissatisfaction percentage is around 60 and 70. Can I ask what they mean by Brussels leadership? Most of the time they think of the European Commission. Okay, and they mean the commission as the president of the commission or they mean the people who work? In I mean, I'm trying to understand what the people, what, what, how the question was asked or if it was asked this, this way. This was the question. What the people actually thought about when they were answering that question. Are you because rather satisfied or rather dissatisfied with the work of the European Union's Brussels leadership? I've studied European studies. I have a I have a PhD in European studies, and I would have trouble answering that question. Well, because who is that? Is it the council, and is it the people who represent my country in Brussels? Is it the president? Very is it good the question. MEP? My MEP? All MEPs? The group? This is a very this important is, question. I think the problem of many of the questionnaires that we are asking about the EU, but we don't really. Ask the way people can easily understand the question. I think, as we mentioned, this is a huge problem with uh, communicating that are you against the EU? No, we are not against the EU. The EU is a fantastic project. It's a peace project, it's a prosperity project, it's a successful project. And we can say outmost um, that we, whoever is talking about uh, Euroscepticism, uh, as we heard about the Czech example, I am, um, I am, um, I don't understand why the Czechs are so uh, Eurosceptic, but I think if you go deep, deep inside, I think most of the people are pro-Europeans. What we see is that they are dissatisfied with some of the things what's happening in this level, in this decision level. Okay. I see Roland is ready to, to ask me. <laughs> I, will, I will ask also Veronica, just, to, just very briefly, if you oh, can tell okay. me if you uh, feel that the countries actually are using the benefits, but at the same time, they use the benefit of being there, thinking that it's something automatic, to the expense of criticizing the EU to get more votes. Yeah, I'm not supposed to... Uh, uh, talk in behalf of uh, Czech uh, government, but uh, <laughs> in my personal point of view, it's definitely like that. That uh, maybe not uh, Czech high officials in uh, EU, but uh, Czech politicals are definitely the heavy free riders in that uh, way. And I hope it will change soon because um, you can you are not able to uh, just taking uh, all the benefits and uh, at the same time uh, complaining uh, to your donates so and uh, if I may go back to your second question about the Russian influence so uh, I think it's well known even uh, outside the Czech borders that our current president and uh, even our former president uh, have a very close uh, uh, relationship with uh, Russia and uh, it's something that uh, Russia is really happy about and uh, really support because uh, of course uh, there uh, Every, every friend in the middle of an uh, enemy's field is welcome, I think, for them. So uh, that, that is something uh, that we, uh, um, we recognized uh, in uh, our last presidency uh, votes uh, in February. And uh, uh, I think the Czech politics politicians and authorities uh, have to uh, decide very soon where they want to belong and uh, and uh, what uh, the real enemy uh, are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My, my general feeling of the Visegrad countries in the EU is that you have, you have, a teen, you have teenage four children 
who want to take all the benefit of living with the mum and dad in a nice house and, <laughs> and borrow their fancy car and uh, have no responsibility, but at the same time, they will tell them that, you know, you're really stupid, you don't understand me, uh, you don't let me be myself, you give me rules, and... Yes, and so let's hope that it's the kind of maturity stage, uh, 30 years uh, yeah. almost since uh, since the revolutions that, no, I can't hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Czechoslovak people, they have the experience, there's a certain peril, it's not big, but it's obvious. Uh, we are building for two decades a Czechoslovak citizenship that at the end of the day ended up as a failure. There's a Czech Republic and Republic of Slovakia. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. And if there was not Soviet Union, we would probably say goodbye to each other a lot earlier. Um, now we are building European um, kind of uh, identity and uh, I am afraid that countries like Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary were simply expected to be a lot faster in their um, ability to act in favor of European identity than is the capacity of a people. When I was in here, I saw people, this you, in age of my parents, the rest of you are very young people, but there is no generation of my parents' majority, and these people are totally out of the game. With their 550 euro pension, language skills, which are zero, so they are practically the passive members of EU, we cannot have high expectations from them at all. Okay, thank you for the comment. Roland, I know you wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Thanks, Ronald Freudenstein, Policy Director of the Martin Center. And, you know, I propose let's get more operational. I have a very simple question. Would it make sense to tie the instruments of economic solidarity of the European Union, i.e. regional funds, agricultural funds, cohesion funds, to the fulfillment of a rule of law catalog? Would that make sense? What effects would it have? Thank you. Now, Mr. Boni, what do you think? Um, uh, we can collect some questions, uh, I hope. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, okay. I'll rather answer them and then, then go rest so we don't mix okay, them up. Okay. Firstly, I, I wanted to describe the situation. So when I'm describing elder, also elderly people with their fears, I'm not attacking them. This is the background for some processes. And I understand it. It's not so easy to create the European citizenship. Our faults in Poland, our mistakes, are related to the situation that some years ago we have no awareness how important it is to give to the people stronger national identity in a positive sense after 1989. Patriotism in positive sense, yes? Because we were focused on transformation, on modernization, on building infrastructure, on thinking, the, uh, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. So the consequence of this mistake is that people now uh, wanted more to have this national identity, not in the sense of uh, patriotism, which is open, but in the sense of uh, nationalism, which is much more closer to different uh, uh, countries, nations, and so on. So, firstly. Secondly, I think that the, in the European Union, we need to discuss about those two anchors of the European Union. Economy, single market, uh, our advantages related to that. And also, I'm sorry that I have interrupted you, because my view is that, of course, this is a responsibility of uh, uh, European institutions, Parliament, com uh, Commission and Council, to inform people about European achievements. 
But on the other hand, it is clear that uh, national poly politicians, governments, should inform uh, uh, about uh, European issues also. But uh, coming back to the question of the rule of law, I don't want to have the situation in which we will punish citizens using uh, uh, some solutions and uh, uh, saying that, okay, uh, because uh, of the situation in which the rule of law is broken, so we have no accessibility to the European money. You know, in the European Parliament, I have voted very strongly uh, 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 fighting for the rule of law. In Poland, in Poland uh, I have s described the polarized situation. I'm the traitor. Every day I'm attacking under the pressure of hate speech and so on and so on. But okay, this is my duty as a politician if I uh, understand my, uh, uh, my vision and my values. But I, do, I want to avoid the situation in which citizens will be punished. So probably we need to discuss about the relation, uh, relationship between uh, uh, cohesion policy, structured fund, participation of European money, and uh, some solutions, which will be, for example, to freeze the money. Not to close, but to freeze the money. And I think it should be also clear to the citizens, yes, that if the government, because this is a stupid situation. Uh, uh, we are uh, 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 full of uh, emotions uh, not to uh, start with uh, uh, some strong uh, instruments uh, addressed uh, to the rule of law. Uh, but on the other hand, we are forgetting about the pressure for the, I'm talking about Poland, for, uh, pressure for the Polish government. All is in hands of Polish government. And they need to, they have to understand that without making some steps, uh, we will have also as citizens some problems, but not uh, this kind of punishment, if I can say, could be addressed not to citizens, but uh, we need to find the proper solution, yes? And uh, we are working on it, yes? Because in the parliament, we don't want to have this as a simple solution. Uh, the rule of law is broken, so there is no accessibility to the European funds. But we need to find, uh, to, 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 to find the solution. And on the other hand, we need to put the pressure to uh, uh, the, some governments. This is not only related to Polish government. I think that if we are looking at some respect to the rule of law, there are some countries. And, and it should be discussed very openly all over the European Union. Thank you. Hildegard. Do you want to say something about this conditionality? Yes, of course. Stick? I mean, um, this, is, this is a club of 28, soon 27. We all pay our membership. We all get back some of the money in different format. I think uh, this is a theoretical question because we know that uh, according to the, the regulations, all country has to agree on the budget and uh, together we also agree on the, how we disturb the budget. I want to come back again to the communication problem. I think until the EU is not going to provide enough information to the citizens, there will be no bridge between Brussels and the citizens. These people are not going to uh, support or understand the whole structure. And I think when we are talking about, I know that this was um, uh, also on the table that um, the Monty um, high level group put down that some way or the other perhaps we can make that the citizens uh, put a penny on the table and say, okay, this is my contribution to the EU project. Perhaps we should think about how to, to make the people at home understanding that, okay, this penny is my penny because my EU is here. So I think the club should really work on its membership. Thank you. <laughs> do, do you want to ask a question? Um, uh, uh, sure. If Gilbert Feil, uh, I fully disagree with you. 
Well, well, I fully disagree with you. We cannot penalize anybody. However, I just would, would any country, because this is penalizing has never ever in the history of mankind promoted democracy. But I would like to just a few points and possible uh, some ideas for uh, for the future. If you can be brief, because we have very little time, well, so maybe the main ideas that. Well, I would like to have the possibility. I was invited here to be there. Europe is missing visionary political leaders. Full stop. Second, Europe is European Union is being manipulated from. East and West, and nobody spoke about uh, the gentleman who he has a uh, monthly meeting in the European Commission at the highest level, who has absolutely nothing to do with Europe and the European Union. I speak about a billionaire who is kicked out from several countries, but apparently he is the good boy in Brussels. I'd like to say that. Thirdly, about whom you are talking? Uh, I speak, think about the same as you, uh, George Soros. Uh, so if, uh, okay. Well, but, but okay, but nobody speaks about that. Uh, the third point I would like to make is... Have you seen what him is, excuse in me? Brussels? Well, I, m I met him in the United States when I was diplomat. The but it's, it's, it's not the same. Have you seen him? Have you met him in Brussels? Give me the answer. I During this meeting with him, officials. I have seen him in uh, 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 pictures see. here in Brussels. I even saw when the president of the European Commission kissed him, if it fulfills uh, you. But this is not the point. <laughs> the, the next point that I would like to make is we have to communicate, but it is not enough to speak. We have to say something. What is the objective, what is the purpose of the European Union, if you degenerate, and the discussion is going that way, to economics, you can forget the European Union. It, European Union must be more than economics. At the beginning, it was clear, it was peace, but we have fulfilled, we have reached. The European Union is the greatest achievement in the history of mankind. But we have to be very careful that within the Brussels bubble, because we are uneducated uh, or we are closed, uh, short-sighted, we are not destroying it from, from inside. And again, I mean, some of uh, uh, the, the Visegrad countries, I have close relation, and I would wish if Professor Anthony Kuklinski you may know, who has been working for some 50 years on Quo Vadis Europe, who could be here, unfortunately, two years ago. He passed away. You certainly know him. But, uh, and the last point that I would like to make, because I feel there's a misunderstanding. We have to understand what is democracy. We, we, we speak about different uh, things. The way of communicating and what to communicate it, and when to communicate it. And thereafter, we have to look at our own stomach and make a self-criticism. Not Orban, not this and this and this made a mistake. Probably we, within the Brussels bubble. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vit, do you, you, you had a question? I mean, we only have very uh, little time left, but yes. Uh, just, just. Just to narrow down the, the question that Roland posed, um, so what about instead of making the uh, reception of the structural funds conditional on the fulfillment of rule of law, rule and law, rule of law, excuse me, but to um, to uh, uh, monitor the implementation of the structural funds, those countries that do not abide by the um, because there are human rights standards in the structural funds implementation, it's it's in place already. So what if the commission stepped in, the country in question would continue receiving the money, but the commission would monitor and administer itself the disbursement of the funds, which is an existing proposal. So just what the panel thought about that. Uh, there was one more question in the, in the, in the back. Uh, yeah, I've got 
Three quick questions. Okay, oh, but big ones. But but they're, 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 I'll be very can quick. Can you just but choose it, one that you no, think but is but the most important one? You can answer because it as one. Because we have three minutes. But you'll answer it as one. It's a very quick. It's a very. It, they're all connected. So mm. how how is one? How is because I've heard all these uh, issues. You know, connected. I'm from Britain, so I've seen a lot of this scapegoating, etc. You know, how concretely do you deal with these problems of blaming the EU for everything? How do you deal with populists who make exaggerated <laughs> claims? Uh, which are untrue. Do, I mean, do you have an example of that ahead of the European Parliament elections to give people like me confidence that things are going to be done? And, and, and how should we deal with um, misinformation from the Russians? I mean, the big questions, I know, but some sort of answers. Would, would be... uh, I can only say to that before, before you come with the, with the mic. Wrong way, as the situation shows, that until now, the strategy of dealing with this was the wrong strategy. So I guess the important thing is to realise that it was wrong and try really hard and really quickly to find a better response uh, to this. But that's just um, because we are really, really big questions. Do you want to react? Uh, just I, I wanted to thank you, yeah, because we can, we can discuss about some issues. I have mentioned my mistakes in Poland as a member of some governments. I, I understand <coughs> it, and I think that in politics it's better to say, okay, we have made some mistakes at that time, and we need to improve the situation. It doesn't mean that I can, uh, and that, that I need, and that, that I want to, to uh, uh, support and approve some decisions done by the current government when I'm not uh, 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 the supporter of this government because of very serious uh, reasons, yes? So, yeah, okay, I, I'm open for discussion. I'm open for discussion. There are many mistakes, but I think that what we need to avoid is to use the language which is under the populism, language in which we are using some symbols, yes? I think that Soros is used in the debate, especially today, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Hungary, as a symbol, as a scapegoat. It's dangerous to use this kind of languages using sca scapegoats because it's not uh, the way to explain and to understand the situation. But I have, I have asked you, left, I so have asked you the question if you have seen them. We can leave the okay. question of George Soros for the okay. coffee break. <laughs> yeah. very I'm good. sorry, ju just because I think that we need a stronger and uh, longer discussion on on, uh, on those issues. Uh, yeah, you are smiling, so okay. Thank you very much. Not. Uh, do you want to say something yes. about what Beat said about not exactly cutting the funds, but? Uh, monitor better the implementation, the connection between the funds and the observation of, uh, of human rights and rule of law? Is a well, um, the Commission is uh, looking at how these funds are used mid-term. There are so many reports, uh, mid-term and, and, uh, and follow-up reports. I think the Commission is doing a great job with that. There is OLAF also investigating where the money goes. We know that uh, there are some countries which are critical. I don't want to name them. But uh, I want to say one more word, uh, what Mr. Boni said, and I think it's really important, that, and your question, that how we can solve uh, some of these questions is that I think it's Time that some of the Brussels people actually go to these capitals and talk to the people. And so, I mean, today the headline is that Juncker is going to Athens and nobody else before he did it. There were no president commissioner in, in Athens before. So, so it was like a headline, headline news that now finally Juncker is going to the national parliament, is going to giving a speech, and that's a very big thing. I think many of the people who are working in Brussels should connect more and more to these countries and uh, get into very good uh, discussions and spread the news what uh, this whole European institution is about. Okay, thank you very much uh, for coming to the panel. I would like to invite you to have some more coffee and get ready for the fourth panel. Uh, thank you again. And I'm sorry if we didn't have time for all the questions, but of course you're more than welcome to ask the panelists during the coffee break for whatever interests you.